All right. So you got a, you got a good uh, uh, Bible goal this month, uh, the book of Romans. And for those of you that just want a quick crash course, there's some favorites uh, in the book of Romans. One of my favorites in the book of Romans is that it is the kindness of God that leads to repentance. It's the kindness of God that leads to repentance. Or how about this one in Romans chapter 3? For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Or another, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Or Romans 6, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Or Romans 8 says, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And Romans 10, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen. Romans is uh, the, the classic place where people that are seeking God, they're curious, they're intellectually curious about faith and are exploring when they be, read the book of Romans, it ties it all together. Yeah. And so I want to encourage you to go ahead and jump in to the book of Romans and read it uh, for yourself. So next Sunday is Mother's Day, Woo! and we have an uh, opportunity for you on Mother's Day, which is to take family photos. And so family means a lot of different things. It might be moms bringing their kids. It might mean some hodgepodge of people that you've assembled in your life that are your family. It might mean some friends. It, 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 it might mean... You like doing selfies out there? I don't know what it means, okay? So it means lots of different things, but the thing that's different is that we're going to print the pictures out uh, for you, and uh, you'll be able to pick them up the following week. So please uh, uh, bring those that you consider your family with you for that opportunity. I just want to highlight this as well. Mother's Day is always complicated, much like Father's Day and every holiday. Um, uh, it's not an automatic win for everybody. And so in a, in a moment when everybody's going to be talking about how great moms are, we, we recognize that we should honor mothers, and uh, I want to make sure that we do that. But we also recognize that there are many who are grieving, and it's complicated. Yeah. And I want you to get this. This is a sign of great spiritual maturity to be able to grieve and honor at the exact same time. Exactly. Okay? We, we don't shut down honoring because we're grieving. Okay? And so uh, we need to do both at the same time. So I challenge you uh, as we lead into Mother's Day. And I know that many people like Mother's Day is the worst day of the year for them, okay? But let's move, let's move and grow in that area as well. Because for many, it's the best day of the year. And so let's both grieve and honor as we need to do so. It was late August 2001, and East Coast International Church was just a few months old at the time. We had been in negotiations to purchase what we thought would be our very first uh, uh, a permanent worship center. It was the old uh, Hoffman's department store on Union Street for those of you that are old school learners. We had made an offer. They accepted. We signed the papers on the building, the first round of papers, early on a Wednesday morning in late August. A professor of uh, architecture from Wentworth Institute of Technology was walking through the building with me uh, because they were going to make our future worship center and the whole facility their class project in architecture for the semester. After several hours of walking through the building and, and making plans, we left uh, the building. And later on that evening, the building was set on fire by some teenagers in some type of gang ritual. All 85,000 square feet burned to the ground. Just to put it in perspective for you, this four-story build, four building that we're in uh, uh, is nowhere near that size. Uh, that building was three times the size of this building. Now, I will tell you, as that building burned to the ground, I will never forget that night. At first, as we watched the building burn, or as I watched the building burn, first there were hundreds of people that came out onto Union Street to watch it burn. Then it was thousands of people, because it lasted a really long time. Maybe some of you were there that night. As people came to watch it burn, it burned and it burned and it burned. It exploded at one point, and people were like, whoa, and uh, as the roof collapsed in, and people watched it burn, and it burned for several days. Like, as the, in the rubble, the firemen had to, like, keep water on it because it was burning underground. I remember that night stepping back from the crowd, and I started to watch the people as the people watched the building burn, and they were entranced. They were focused, like... It was just wild as they would chat about like what was happening and they couldn't believe it and they were sharing stories about the Hoffman building and all this, all this kind of stuff was going on. 
Well, my, my experience was different than everybody else's experience that night. <laughs> they were watching a building burn. I was watching our dreams burn. And I remember stepping back as I'm watching the crowd, and I thought, hmm, God, I, I don't think that was supposed to happen. <laughs> you know, it was like one of those, huh, that's, that's not how it was supposed to happen. But the crowd, that the crowd was what was intriguing to me. The crowd was completely engaged with the fire. They were watching it very carefully. They were watching the firemen as the firemen battled the flames to prevent the spreading of, uh, of the uh, fire to other buildings because we didn't want another infamous Lynn fire on Union Street. And so they, they bravely fought it. The people were entranced. And that's the part that caught my attention. Because there are moments in life when you are entranced and you like really want to pay attention to what's going on and to know if something's true or not true. There was a time, a long time ago, when there was another large crowd, thousands of people that had gathered together, and they were watching really intently, and they weren't quite sure what they were watching. They weren't quite sure what they were hearing. They weren't sure if what they were seeing in front of them was the miracle of all miracles, or if they were watching what was about to become a giant dumpster fire. They just weren't sure. And here they were on the side of this hill next to the Sea of Galilee in Israel. And there's Jesus standing and he's speaking. And the people were listening to Jesus with full engagement. They weren't sure if this was real or not. But they sure wanted to believe that it was true. They wanted to believe what, what this guy was saying. They definitely wanted to, but it was not like anything they had really heard before. And it was certainly not like anything they had seen before. And Jesus said this in, in our continuing series. He said this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, in what is frequently called the greatest sermon in history. Jesus says, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Amen. In this moment, when he says, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. There's definitely people in the crowd that day that would have thought, Jesus is just messing with us now. Because no place in the world are the merciful shown mercy. But Jesus is saying that in his kingdom, the merciful will not be marginalized, rather they will be the heroes in his kingdom. That in his kingdom, mercy is the highest of values. And that's a big deal because then and now, even to this day, people that show mercy are normally taken advantage of and not giving anything but a whole bunch of headaches. Amen. Which is where the saying comes from, no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> it's, it's not like our society's highest value, mercy. But what is mercy anyhow? Just to make sure we're on the same page. Mercy is kindness. It's kindness in excess of what might be expected or demanded by fairness. It's forgiveness, forbearance, a compassion. Yeah. It's refraining from harming offenders, people that you have the right to harm and choosing not to. That's mercy. Yeah. It's, uh, think about a car wreck, like when there's a big car pile up. There's really three types of people at these, at these scenes. Uh, the injured, of course, the people that are injured. Then there's the self-absorbed people that are worried about the tiny little scratch or dent on their car. And then there's the merciful. The merciful are those who forget about all the stuff and start to help and assist those that have been injured in any possible way. So you have these kind of three groups. In God's kingdom, mercy is shown. And that's, a, that's one of the aspects of God's kingdom that's different than the kingdoms of this world. Mercy is shown to those that sorrow, to those that suffer, and to those that are sinful. Mercy is shown. Mercy shows itself in the desire and actions of those desiring to make uh, the sorrow, suffering, and sin of others less. By, so the merciful are on task or on mission with Jesus in bringing those that are far from God close to God. That is mercy. Mercy givers do not um, despise others they do not uh, despise those that other people reject. Instead, they embrace them. Amen. Those that are merciful embrace the poor. And those that are merciful embrace the foreigners. 
And those that are mercy, merciful embrace the immigrant. And those that are merciful embrace the hurting. And those that are merciful embrace those in agony. And those that are merciful embrace those, even those that do sinful things. Yeah. That is what mercy does. Amen. It embraces those that others don't embrace. Our, our culture, let's just think about our culture for a minute. And before we like want to just talk about our culture being the whole best culture in the whole wide world, let's pay attention to what our culture really does. Our culture does not make heroes of mercy givers. It doesn't. Think about what we value. Think about what we highlight as a culture. Think about the magazines or, or the blogs or the, the websites and what, what they highlight. No, they, People Magazine and Teen and, and Sports Illustrated and all these kind of these, these influence places. What they highlight is those that are the sexiest or those that are the strongest or those that are the meanest or those that make the most money. That's not God's kingdom. That's not the culture we're supposed to embrace. We're supposed to embrace the culture of the kingdom of God. Now imagine, just imagine with me, in the kingdom of Jesus, it'll be a little different. Yeah. People magazine in the kingdom of Jesus will, on the cover, have like the 10 most outrageous mercy givers. <laughs> Sports Illustrated will, will cover the 100 most merciful players of the century. Yeah. Forbes magazine will have the 10 greatest mercy givers of 2024. The TV shows will be different. Of lifestyles of the merciful and kind. Amen. College scholarships will be given to the most merciful student in high school. That'll be a whole different kingdom. Right? But that's the kingdom we're supposed to be establishing right now. That's supposed to be who we are. That's supposed to be the values that we honor. So let me tell you something right now. Mercy givers are seldom, this is really important to get your head around so you don't, you don't get it twisted. Mercy givers are seldom selected for the most prestigious awards. By the world standards, the mercy givers are afterthoughts. Second place, runner-ups, frequently ignored. Every once in a while, a mercy giver will break through the noise. And every once in a while, they'll prick the conscience of a region or a nation or the world think Mother Teresa. But after you name maybe one or two more, you run out of names. We don't, as a culture or as a globe, give great honor to the mercy givers. But in the kingdom of Jesus, they are the heroes. So when you are thinking, wow, I've I, I want to give mercy, but it doesn't seem like uh, I'm going to get any uh, uh, attention for this. But you're right. You won't. Amen. Only from God. Amen. Only from God. Yeah. So the mercy givers are the exact kind of people that Jesus is giving honor to. And Jesus is making it clear that mercy givers will receive the royal treatment from God in his kingdom. And so I want to encourage you today uh, uh, for those of you that are mercy givers, for those of you in our church that are mercy givers, it's, it's something that God has done within you. You are the ones who give mercy. Those of you who look out for those that other people have forgotten about, those of you who embrace the unembraceable, those of you who stand with the marginalized, those of you who skip opportunities to advance in order to directly serve the most difficult to serve, those who repeatedly forgive those in the midst of chaos. Pay attention to this for a second, you mercy givers. Nobody else notices, but God notices. God notices, and he says that mercy is available to you mercy givers in a very different way. Mercy will be shown to you. You are what are Matthew 5 mercy givers. Jesus says, if you show mercy in my kingdom, you will have mercy shown back towards you. By, by who? By God. And his rewards are forever. Now, let's say you're a little rusty at the mercy giving thing. Like, you walked in here today. That wasn't like on the top 10 list today to show the most mercy. I want to encourage you to give it a shot. Go ahead and try to show some mercy. Extend mercy to those around you. 
For years at the church here, we've had a great ministry, our transportation ministry. And it was really designed to help those that can't access church or get to church so that they could have community, uh, a community of faith. And during the pandemic, it really crushed our ability to to have that ministry. And then to restart, it's been really complicated. And it's honestly just annoyed me. It's annoyed me ever since. Because it was one of the most merciful ministries in our church. And we stopped it. It It's like, ugh. So Dan Johansson and I, for quite a while, have been looking for a a nice used shuttle van to purchase. And the good news is it's being delivered this week. (laughs) And... uh, so we're relaunching our transportation ministry. And for those of you that just clapped, uh, you know you're set up now. Okay, it's going to cost money, right? It's going to cost money to do this. And so if you would like to give to this, you can in the Church Center app. Just go to the van, uh, the van giving opportunity, and you can just give to that. Now, but that's not really why I told you that. Why I told you that is because... If this is the kind of thing that you're like, oh, I could do that, and I could show mercy, and this is the kind of thing I would like to do, you can sign up for more information on how to volunteer, okay, Uh, in the Church Center app as well. So when Jesus starts, he says, blessed. Uh, What is this blessed thing anyhow? What's this blessed mean? People use the word blessed all the time, not knowing what it means. Well, uh, blessed means enjoying great happiness. Yeah. This is God's wisdom that when we show mercy, we receive happiness. That we receive something from God. It's happiness. It's joy. In another version of what Jesus said, it says, God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. So it's God that's doing the blessing. So here's the idea. It's the rule in our series called The Rule. Not the rule of like the Ten Commandments, the rules, but the rule. This is how the kingdom operates. The rule in the kingdom is that the merciful in God's kingdom will not go unnoticed. And that God himself takes it upon himself, it is his responsibility to bless those who are merciful. He, that's, that's the relationship in his kingdom. The merciful will be blessed. The merciful will be shown mercy. Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. It's a horrible verse. Then your reward (laughs) will get, and you will be sons of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. What? Jesus says God is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. That is good news for all of you today, right? (laughs) That is great news. Because the truth is, when you were thinking about somebody else who's ungrateful and wicked, Jesus was talking about you. (laughs) Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. That's a tough verse. You can live with that. Just let it sit. (laughs) Human wisdom would say this to the ungrateful and wicked, to your enemy. It would say, show rage and wrath and revenge and you will feel better. If you don't think we think that as a culture, if we changed our entertainment, if we changed what we valued to merciful and kind, 80% of the movies on Netflix would disappear. Right? Because they're all about rage and revenge and, and wrath. God says the opposite. He says, The merciful will be shown mercy, and in this you can rejoice and be happy, forever receiving blessings from God, because you are merciful. And I think in life we really should posture ourselves to be as blessed by God as much as possible. Because it's a tough world to live in. And it would be rather be blessed than unblessed. Amen. Several years ago, we had a, a big rainstorm here in Lynn on a Sunday morning, 2018. And uh, we were having church on that Sunday morning. And our brand new roof that had been installed incorrectly, unfortunately, 
uh, let more rain into the building than it kept out of the building that day. <laughs> there we are having church. The rain's coming in on the fourth floor. The worship team's singing songs about Lord send the rain and, and, the, and stuff. And that's a true story. And we have no idea. It's rain's coming. Rain's coming. Third floor is flooding. I mean, thousands of gallons. Not like, for those of you that were here, you know what I'm talking about. But for those of you that weren't, thousands of gallons. Second floor flooded. So the kids, when we start hearing kids stuff going, all of a sudden we see drips happening. And I'm like, oh man, the, the toilet's on the second floor, overflowing or something. That's what I thought. And I'm like, oh no, this is the rain. <laughs> this is the rain. So like we're still having church. I'm pretty intense about having church no matter what. So I'm like, I don't care. It's raining in the building. Let's keep having church. But then, then people started freaking out, standing up. Like, okay, I guess we got to pause for a little bit. So everybody scattered and went out. And all over, everybody found any bucket, a trash can, like a purse, like anything that could hold. People were like going around. Their, their solution was, let's catch as much rain as possible in the building. It was a great day. It's actually one of my favorite memories of our church, except for the building damage, right? And so everybody just went to work, went to work. Some people were scared. They thought they were going to get electrocuted or something. Fair, fair. But the, uh, so everybody was going around collecting uh, in buckets all the rain. And it really is. Uh, it was a great memory. We, we figured it all out. We actually... Uh, we're able to have the next service. We actually got the building, the first floor all set. We did have the next service. I mean, there was thousands of gallons of water. And I mean, flood was all over the place. Some of your cars, I think we had nine cars that were totaled from the flooding outside, including mine. Like, it was crazy. So it was a crazy day. But everybody's going around, like catching as much of the rain as possible, catching as much of the rain as possible. And there's a couple of lessons we learned that day. One, stop singing Lord, send the rain and Lord, send the fire songs. All right? He's taking us way too seriously. Way too seriously. And second, catch all the rain you can. The rule in the kingdom is this. There are certain things that God blesses. In fact, Jesus says there's nine things that God blesses. Very clearly. I would suggest that you go and get as many spiritual buckets as possible and let God bless you in those nine areas of, of your life. Yeah. Get as much of God's blessing as possible. Like rain from heaven. Get some buckets and let God fill them up with blessings. And one of those places is God blesses the merciful. Yeah. So how do you show mercy? Well, before, you show, before we learn how to show mercy, why? Why should we show mercy? And there's really three quick reasons. One is for happiness. Okay, you're blessed. You're, uh, Matthew 5, 7, Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. We also aren't just blessed. We don't want to just show mercy for our, our own happiness. We want to uh, show mercy because if we, <laughs> we want to be shown mercy. Right. James chapter 2 says, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Right. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Right. And then, of course, for others. We want to be merciful for the sake of other people. Jude says, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. So there's reasons that we need to be merciful. But how? How do you do this? How do you actually show mercy? Well, you show mercy because it, it starts inside. It starts with your attitude first, yeah. and then your actions. It starts with your character, who you are, yeah. and then action. It starts with your being before your doing. Because, yeah. friends, truthfully, it's virtually impossible to show true mercy without being merciful. Yeah. Like, inside. Yeah. It's an inner transformation that impacts your outer world. Yeah. In fact, when you go through this sermon that Jesus is preaching in Matthew chapter 5, and he says all these blessed are, blessed are, blessed are, blessed those. He's talking about all things that need inner work. That in his kingdom, it is different. There is an inner transformation of the heart that leads to exterior conduct. So, let me walk you through the Bible really quickly. In the beginning, God establishes himself with the people. The people of God, okay? Yeah. 
And basically, the people of God can go around saying, my God's better than your fake gods. <laughs> right? So my God's the best. Woohoo! He'll beat up your God any day of the week. Kind of, that's, that's the theme, okay? So God. Then God gets a little serious with the people and says, okay, that's enough of that now. You have to start living right. And so I'm setting up rules for you in what this means. You have, hence the Ten Commandments and things like that. And so you get this sense that, okay, now we live by a different standard. Okay, so you have God being awesome. Then you have this way of, this, this way of conduct, this way of living. We do things differently. We do things morally. We do things ethically. There's all of this kind of stuff. Now, now we're going. We're going to fast forward through the Bible. Clearly, after a couple thousand years of this, honestly, it's not working. That's why Jesus came. Because you can't do the moral, ethical things without inner transformation in your heart. Your heart has to be changed. And so that's where Jesus comes in. And now it becomes God takes it upon himself to do an inner work on who you are through Jesus Christ. And he does the work in us. So he shows us mercy, and now we are able to be merciful. Because our heart has been transformed. This is the, the cr very critical aspect of what's going on. Sometimes people get this all twisted and messed up. They think, oh, I'll, I, I'll be a, a Christian in my basic moral thinking but in my, with other people, but in my private life, I'll just go do whatever I want. Or I'll, I'll do my best to follow Jesus on Sundays and uh, maybe one other day of the week. And all the other time, that's for me. I'll do whatever I want. Or uh, I'll help... I'll help with a few good things over here and I'll just like schedule that in but the rest of my life I'm just going to do whatever I want. That really does miss the whole point. Mm -hmm. yes, it does. Either we allow Christ to have freedom in our life to lead us or we don't. Mm -hmm. And good news for us, Christ is patient and kind and gentle. Yeah. He's kind yeah. and he won't force us but it will constantly draw us to the real need, like to the reality that our true need is him for that inner transformation. All we have to do is follow. All we have to do is follow his lead. You see, Jesus loves you just the way you are, but he loves you way too much to let you stay that way. That's, that's, that's that back and forth. That's that tension that we live in. As the worship team comes up, if we allow Jesus to forgive us and to lead our lives, that's who we are in that moment, deep within. It's not just something you do, it's who you are. Amen. It's who you are. And you can't be merciful unless you have experienced mercy, yeah. unless your heart actually is merciful. Amen. Amen. What we do, our actions, is an outflow of who we truly are. Mm -hmm. So when Jesus says in his kingdom... Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. What's happening there is he's saying that in his kingdom, hearts are transformed. We become merciful. It is the value of the kingdom. Inner transformation is the goal. Have your heart changed from within. Not pretending, but actually becoming merciful. The kingdom of Jesus is not... Uh, about smoke and mirrors. It's not about taking something ugly and, and rotten and just doing like a quick house flip and spray painting over it. The other day I was driving, I saw this old beat up Mercedes, all rusty and nasty, and somebody taking some spray paint to it to try to cover it up. It's great. Still got a lot of issues with that car, right? The spray paint's not helping. But that's what people do with a, like a pretend faith. They just try to paint it on. That's not what Jesus is asking for. He's asking for your heart. Amen. It's hard to be merciful if you're not actually merciful. So your faith is who you are. Your actions are a result of who you are. Why don't you stand with me as we close? As the worship team uh, wraps this up today, 
I think there's ways that we could respond. I, I think it's really critical that we respond to the words of Jesus that in his kingdom, blessed are the merciful. And recognize that the only way that happens is if we surrender our hearts to Jesus and let Jesus do the inner work and receive the mercy of God through Jesus Christ. So wherever you're at with this today, I encourage you, start there. Let Jesus do that inner work to let us become more merciful. The altars are open if you'd like to spend some time in prayer.